Hello, my beautiful friends. Uh, this is going to be a fairly intense little video. If you're able to read between the lines and put together the uh, little puzzle pieces. Uh, I've discussed some of this stuff before and I put uh, some breadcrumbs uh, down previously and I've laid out a good portion of some of this stuff. But uh, I'm going to try to bring it together in a way that will help um, practitioners uh, in the future, hopefully. And uh, this is the stuff that just baffles most people who study ufology, phenomena, uh, and abilities that are stunning, and most people don't even really know exist. Uh, they are attained only in rarefied conditions, but, uh, you know, you do a little bit of the research and it's empirical. So, uh, let me let you look at this for a moment and then we'll dive in. Mm-hmm. All of these are unified. They all connect. They all have an underlying theme. And not everyone has really put the pieces together. You're going to hear some things I've repeated before. But, for example, UFOs and phenomena hotspots. Uh, and there's been these type of locations throughout history. Locations where there are a bizarre series of effects. And the effects um, are things from disembodied voices, strange creatures, orbs, UFOs, uh, strange lighting effects. And it's not just Skinwalker Ranch. You, you can see this at East Seti Ranch, Gillilands, and there's been places throughout history that have had these. UFOs and Phenomena Hotspots share some very peculiar, unique sort of symptoms, effects, phenomena. And you've heard me talk about it before. I'll just mention three of the more interesting ones. Uh, UFOs and Phenomena Hotspots both share something called mirroring, where, uh, let's start with the UFOs. The UFO will copy or mirror your actions or your behavior or kind of your spirit, I guess, your nature. They will physically copy you. If you have a flashlight and you flash it at them, they will mimic. Or if you move physically with your jet craft, it will do a counter uh, movement like Fravor discussed. And also phenomena locations. Phenomenal locations like Skinwalker and East Seti and other places have a tendency to reflect, to mirror the people who are observing these effects. If you come with a militarized kind of attitude, you'll get some more militarized type effects. If you come with a wonderful open heart and altruism, a great spirit like that, you will get beautiful colorful lighting effects. So first there's mirroring. And second, there's precognition. There is a history of UFOs doing things that the observer was going to do. With the Nimitz case, uh, it's very well known that the UFO went to the way point before he even went there. And now there's a, a, there's a bunch of other theories on how it could do that, but there's tons of these cases uh, where there was this precognitive effect. Uh, 
And that's also the same thing with phenomena. Bigelow and other scientists who worked at uh, Skinwalker talked about they just were so frustrated because the phenomena seemed to be precognitive of them. It knew what it was, what they were going to do. So we've got mirroring, uh, precognitive, and just one more, even though there's a bunch. And let's do the hitchhiker effect. People who observe UFOs tend to have strange phenomena follow them home, right? And that has also been seen and experienced at different phenomena locations. The effects and weird things will follow them home. So these are two completely different things, UFOs and phenomena hotspots, or so it seems. So what else mirrors you, is precognitive of you, and follows you home? You do. You do. Your consciousness does. Jacques Vallée and others have speculated that consciousness has something to do with both of these. <clears throat> and I know it's the, you know, it's the favorite uh, hot, hot word right now. It's the N-word consciousness. But I think it's, to be more specific, it's subconsciousness. Now, if you look at a few more things, you add a few more things to this list here. It's not just UFOs and phenomena hotspots. There's also the Hutchinson effect. I don't know how much you guys know about that, but there's a lot of similarities in all three of these. And also, slide nine from the Chris Mellon leak, which is essentially um, an incredible part of the conclusions that ATIP made after studying the best military cases for, I think it was around 15 years, with the highest end sensors and the, the best kind of witnesses. And they came up with these incredible conclusions that are in this slide now, I won't go through them all, but they are all essentially effects that can be reproduced by consciousness. So, all of these hint at a stupefying new science. And even if you don't get the new science, all of these have some pretty stupefying implications if you really start thinking about it. So, these special little effects, and there's a bunch more, and, and it's very interesting they do have a relation to consciousness or even subconsciousness. Let's look at Hutchinson for a moment and tie Hutchinson into this stuff. Hutchinson had an ability to produce a wide range of effects. It first started with uh, high energy orbs. And even he would say, don't get near the target area because you could get exposed to broadband radiation, or broad spectrum radiation. He would, over time, he learned to control this ability that was more subconscious initially. And that more raw subconscious form became malleable. And in fact, this is just a list of some of the things he was able to do. And I've spoken with John, I've had, you know, Hathaway uh, studied him very closely, probably one of the people who studied him the most wrote a great book about it. I've spoken with Hathaway and I've gotten some wonderful insights from him, especially about the John stuff. And I spoke to, uh, I've even, well, I'm gonna get into it, but a little experience with Colonel here and CIA put John into a building for a few months too. A lot of people have studied him Here's just a few of the things John was able to reproduce. Levitation. Taking metal bars and jellifying them. Shattering them. One of the big goals he wanted to do, and it was very difficult, and he only, was only able to do it a few times for a few 
seconds is turning metals transparent. Transparentization. <laughs> he did real transmogrification. Turning one metal, and if you looked at the locations where he was able to bend it non-locally, the metal was changing molecular structure and form. He took some metals and made them incandescent. So hot, so full of energy, they're glowing and sending sparks, but under very specific kind of conditions. And this, these were all things he was wanting to impress and freak out scientists. <laughs> he would read something in the latest science magazine like magnetic monopoles. And he'd be like, oh my gosh, I gotta make one. And the next week he would make one and he made the monopoles. He made solid state batteries. He took a bunch of stones, threw them in a pipe, put two ends on it and made a bunch of these. And some of them are still running to this day. Japan, a Japanese company has a few of these. So he was able to read and reproduce these amazing effects. Does that tell you anything? It's not like these were the only effects possible and he stumbled across them. Now this ability and these kind of things and so many others are only possible under a rare convergence of circumstances. It's very rare. It requires a, a very interesting convergence. And maybe in the future, I'll go into more detail. But John made a very conscious decision never to do the effect and his methods in front of the CIA or in front of other people. Because he knew the implications were off the charts. And maybe a skinny guy in the Bronx has some insights into this. Maybe has reproduced some of these effects. And has a little, a couple notions into the implications. What do you guys think about all this stuff?